it will help you. Amen. Would you get your Bibles out or your smart devices, whatever you're using this morning, to look at God's Word? We're going to start in John the fifth chapter. But before we get there, uh, last week we discussed and looked at uh, miracles and manifest miracles, and when God manifests those miracles uh, in uh, our lives and in our midst, uh, what that does brings glory to God. It's a sign to the unbeliever. Some certain things that it does, you can go back and re review that. This morning we're going to look at the miracles of the Messiah. Now we know that Jesus did many miracles. You can look throughout the Scriptures and find the miracles that Jesus did uh, and He performed. But there were miracles that took place in the Old Testament. Uh, it's not confined to the miracles of Jesus. There were miracles that took place uh, under the hand of Moses, as he went down to, to help deliver the children of Israel from Egypt, uh, he performed many miracles. And yes, the Egyptian magicians did as well. But we know that the power of God is greater. We see that demonstrated that when Moses threw down his rod and it became a snake, and the, the Egyptian magicians threw down, I almost said musicians. <laughs> magicians threw their staff down they both became snakes but the snake of Moses ate up the snake of the the Egyptians showing that the power of God is greater Elijah performed seven miracles in his ministry Elisha his uh, mentee <laughs> he performed 14 miracles in his ministry including raising the dead at his death the body of a dead soldier that was killed fell into the grave where Elisha's bones were he rose from the dead many Jewish scholars claim that even the Pharisees were performing miracles at the time of Jesus however Jesus performed four miracles that proved that he was the Messiah we call those messianic miracles not messianic from the masons but messianic there's a difference these miracles proved that He was the Messiah. These, there are four of these. The Bible calls them special miracles that the Messiah did. And when He did them, it created an unusual uproar and outrage from the religious leaders. I'll give you a prophetic word right now. As the manifest miracles of God begin to flow from your life and from your hands it will cause religious systems and leaders to begin to criticize, to doubt. They become cynics and they become haters when the miracles of God flow. Now notice I didn't add anything to, I said they're going to flow from your hands because you're a believer and signs and wonders follow them who believe. Amen? We're going to look at that deeper here in a few minutes. But there will always be critics and doubters and unbelievers and haters that will rise up. Don't drink the haterade. <laughs> the messianic proof miracles are those miracles Jesus did that, religious, that the religious system of the day believed that only the Messiah could do. So although there are miracles going on in the Old Testament even into the time of Jesus being performed by Pharisees and prophets, they believed that there were four special miracles that only the Messiah could do. And when someone showed up performing these four miracles, they would know that He was the Messiah. Look at uh, John the 5th chapter with me, verse number 36. John 5, verse 36. It should be on the screen for us all. This is Jesus speaking, and He says, But I have a greater witness than John's. John the Baptist witnessed of Jesus that He was who? The Lamb of God come to take away the sin of the world. Did He take Him away? Yes, He did. For the works, and that word works there in the Gospel of John is the same word for miracles. It's the Greek word for miracles. So Jesus said, For the miracles which the Father has given Me, I like this, to finish... They, the very miracles that I do bear witness that I'm the Messiah. In other words, the miracles that you're seeing me do are proving that my Father in Heaven sent me, that I'm the Messiah and I'm doing them and I came and I won't leave until I finish the work that He called me to do. 
And he said in John 19, 31, it is finished. He finished the work that the Father sent him to do. I'm thankful because without the finished work of the cross, we had no hope. Without the finished work of the cross, we have no salvation. We would be stuck in our own righteousness. And not, man, that just piles up like a bunch of filthy rags. And we thank God for His righteousness. So let's look at these uh, miracles together. Number one, let's look at the man raised from the dead after four days. We saw that even in the Old Testament, the dead were raised. But the Jewish culture and the religious system of that day said that the spirit of a man hovered over his body after death for three days. I don't believe that. I believe that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I do not believe that your spirit hovers over your body. I believe that as a believer takes his last breath on this earth, he takes his next breath in the presence of the Lord. That's what Scripture tells us. How many of you believe that? Say amen. amen. But their belief was that that spirit hovered over the, the man or the woman's body who had died. Even to this day, the Jews will bury someone within 24 hours. There's a certain sect of Jews they will bury. If a soldier is killed in battle and is under the old Jewish custom and re religious belief, then they will bury that body in the uniform that they were killed in with the blood still on it within 24 hours. That's significant. Look at the Scripture with me in John, the 11th chapter. Didn't bring my glasses up here. I'm not sure. John, the 11th chapter. Thank you, sweetie. Isn't she beautiful? Yay. Clear as day. 38 and 39. Then Jesus, again groaning in Himself, came to the tomb. All right, let me set the stage. His friends Mary, Martha, and Lazarus supported His ministry and word got to Jesus that Lazarus was sick. Within a few days, they said, now he's dead. And even after they said he was dead, Jesus didn't go. Now, mind you that within 24 hours of His death, they have placed Lazarus in the tomb. Now Jesus as is at that tomb, and He's groaning in Himself. It was a cave, and a stone lay against Him. Pay attention to that word stone. Jesus said, Take away the stone. There it is again. Martha, the sister of Him who was dead, said to Him, Lord, by this time there is a stench. I'll put that in He'll believe I vernacular for you. He stinks. <laughs> for He's been dead for four days days. Not only has he been dead for four days, but he's been in the tomb for four days. They didn't set his body and embalm it and set it over the side and then when all the family could get there seven days later they had a wake and a funeral. He's been in that cave with a stone rolled in front of it for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you would believe, what did he say? Believe. What's he tell us? All things are possible if we only believe. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was laying, and Jesus lifted up His voice, said, Father, I thank You that You have heard me. And He who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and His face was wrapped with a cloth, and Jesus said to them, Loose Him and let Him go. The first miracle that we see that Jesus is the Messiah is that He raised a dead man who had been dead for four days. Why is that significant? Because no one had ever done that. And the person who did that pointed that He was the Messiah. Remember, the Spirit was hovering for th three days, but now on the fourth day there's no Spirit. So it was a special miracle for someone to be raised from the dead on that fourth day. Well, Pastor, what significant does that have for me? Well, when I look at this Scripture and I see that word stone, it reminds me of the law because it was written on stone tablets. And any time you see the law that was written on stone tablets, it represents the administration of death. And be, what happens is we will hide behind, behind the do's and the don'ts of the law. And all it does is produce death in our life. 
Let me tell you something. You can do everything that the Ten Commandments tell you. Don't commit murder. You can be a good person and never steal, never covet, never lie, never commit adultery, go to church every Sunday morning, read the Word of God, never take God's name in vain, and still go to hell. Why? Because it's only your belief that makes you a believer and causes you to be born into the kingdom of God. Matter of fact, when you believe... You, you get that same thing. Jesus is a giver of new life. Uh, Lazarus received a new life. He was dead, and God breathed into him, and he became uh, living again. Jesus is the gift. When you place your faith and trust in Jesus, not a religious system, not a set of rules, but you place your faith in Jesus and His finished work of the cross, He gives you new life. That same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead quickens, makes alive your mortal body, and you become, you receive eternal life. You were once mortal, now you're immortal. You were once corrupt, but now you've become incorruption. Let me tell you something about that incorrupt seed that, that, that has now been placed inside of you. It says in the Bible that it's a metamorphosis that takes place. When a metamorphosis takes place, we have a great example of that. When a caterpillar enters into the cocoon, and then some months or weeks later, it transforms or metamorphosizes into a butterfly. You ever seen that process? The beautiful butterfly that flies down the road and smacks my windshield. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That butterfly can never become a caterpillar again. It was metamorphosed. You were transformed and you became a brand new... You are not that old thing. You are a brand new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. You can't... It, help me, Jesus. I get so excited. If we will believe that the inferior blood of a lamb would remove the sins of the people for one year, why will we not believe that the superior blood of Jesus Christ will forgive us once and for all? But we'll say that the blood of an inferior lamb will take away your sins for a year. It doesn't. not talking about your behavior. Your sins are cleansed for a whole year because of the inferior blood of a lamb. But Hebrews said that under a better covenant with a better blood, that the superior blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus, would take away, remove your sins as far as the east was from the west. But we'll tell people from one bad behavior that you now, that superior blood is worse than and not as effective as the blood of a goat. Yeah, think about it. The religious leaders got so mad that they began to plot to kill Lazarus. They would rather have Lazarus dead and they will commit murder under a religious system than to rejoice that a dead man had been brought back to life by the power of God. Yes, sir. Now, folks, I believe that God can still do those things. I believe that He can still bring the dead back to life. Physically, as well as spiritually, He's giving new life every day. Now, the Scripture says that the stone was... He said, take away the stone. The stone was removed. The law has been removed. And when the law was removed, when that stone was rolled away, Lazarus stepped out and he had new life but he was still in grave clothes. And what our job to, is, is we are to remove the grave clothes. We are in the business of removing grave clothes from people. What are you talking about, Pastor? We're trying to help them get out from behind that stone, and we want to take that wrapping that's on, off of their head so that they can see and hear. We want to take that wrapping off of their arms so that they can praise God, lift their hands in the sanctuary. We want to take those grave clothes off so that they can begin to walk the walk that God's called them to walk in the blessings that He's called them to walk in. So we are grave clothes removers. Can you tell your neighbor, I'm in the business of removing grave clothes. Jesus gives new life, and we remove grave clothes. Number two, the second miracle that proved that Jesus was the Messiah was He healed a man that was born blind. We don't have any record of any blind eyes being opened in the Old Testament. 
From Genesis to Jesus, we have no record of any blind eyes being opened. And Jesus said in His first sermon, when He quoted from Isaiah 61, He was the Word so He could add to it. And He added to Isaiah 61 and He said, in the discovering of the sight to the blind. That wasn't in the original text. But the Word can add to the Word. Because <laughs> He is the Word. Amen? Amen? So in Luke 4, we see Him preaching His first message. And in preaching that first message, He's been anointed... Y'all stretch your hands towards that baby and pray for him. He's got stomach issues. Just pray for him right now. Claim the healing over his stomach right now. We prayed for him last week. We're believing Jesus is going to touch him and perform a miracle. Amen. Touch him, Jesus. Amen. But he added, too, that he would bring the recovery of sight to the blind. Now, there are several scriptures in where Jesus heals blind eyes. But the particular scripture that I want to look at that brings messianic proof of Jesus being the Messiah is John the ninth chapter. Turn with me to John the ninth chapter. It's on the screen if you don't have a Bible. If you're watching us by the internet right now, uh, there is a Bible there to the side that you can click on and use. And we're in John 9. We're going to look at the New King James. It says, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. That sets the stage right there. This is different and unique from those other blind eyes that he'd opened. Yeah, when he opened up blind Bartimaeus' eyes, it says at the end of the Scripture, I believe it's Mark 10, is that correct, Pastor? Right? Blind Bartimaeus, your favorite Scripture to preach in. Mark the 10th chapter. I preached on it more than any other. Yeah, I know it. You've preached on it more than any other. So I figured you would know that it's found in Mark the 10th chapter. 46 verse. Down through 50, and I believe at 50 it says that he received his sight. The word, the Greek there is recovered. That means he once could see before, then he lost his sight, and then Jesus gave him his sight back. But the scripture in John 9 says that this man was born blind. And under that old religious system, that Jewish culture, they would always want to know why someone had a handicap, why someone had a disability, and they attached generational curses to it. I don't believe in generational curses because Galatians tells me that the curse was hung on the tree. When you put your faith in Jesus, the curse doesn't have any power over you. He broke the curse by His blood. Just one drop could break the curse over your life. So the buck stopped at Jesus. You don't have to claim, well, Daddy had it and Grandma had it and Papa had it and aunts and uncles have it. I don't have it because I'm a new creation with new blood flowing through my veins with a different DNA. But the Old Covenant Scripture said that you could track it back to the 10th generation. And so they encounter a man who's been born blind. Look at what the disciples say. Rabbi, who sinned? Here we go. Did this man's parents sin? That he was born blind? You know, we still do that today. It's unfortunate, but I have had stories when I've had couples in our church that have had children born with disabilities and abnormalities, and preachers will come on the scene and say, well, you must have been in sin. I don't believe in a God that would punish and put something on a child. That's not the God I serve. I don't know who you're serving, but my God does not punish people's sins by... <laughs> you know what that, that's like? That's like my, my kids coming in to the house and telling me something that one of their friends did at school and I take my belt off and I bust their hind ends because of what somebody else did. But now under the new covenant, He won't even punish you. He's already punished Jesus. I take that back. He didn't even punish Jesus because a loving father wouldn't punish his son. Jesus said, no man took my life. He freely laid it down. He freely received those stripes for your healing. He freely took the nails into His hands and the thorns in His head. So you have to backtrack sometimes because some, sometimes my brain, there's still little parts of it that have old covenant mentality in it that I have to take, shove it back in there and put it through the filter of the cross. Amen. Jesus answered their question, Neither this man nor his parents have sinned but that the works of God should be revealed in Him. Jesus said, I must work this miracle of Him who sent me. 
In other words, what he's saying is, this is not because someone did something wrong. This is for the glory of God. Now, God didn't cause it, but He'll take every circumstance, He'll take every situation, and He'll use it for His glory if we'll allow it to. You know the story? He hocks up a goober, spits on the ground, makes some mud pies, and then He takes them, and he, it says, the Scripture says here, He anointed. Now, this is not a spiritual anointing that He took from James the 5th chapter and got a bottle of oil from Israel and anointed. No, he just smeared it. That word anoint there means he smeared it on the man's eyes. Uh, some scholars believe that this man did not even have eyeballs. Just empty sockets. That's just, I've got, the Bible doesn't say that. Some scholars will tell you that. They'll read it and say he was born blind, he didn't have any eye sockets, and Jesus made eyeballs out of the... You believe what you want. I know one thing. This man was born blind, and Jesus put mud pies on his eyes and said, go wash. So he went back down to the pool of Siloam, and when he came back, he was seeing. <laughs> Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, it's not this, is this not the man who sat and begged? So he not only was blind, but because of his blindness, he was begging. I believe that when you, or your eyes are opened up and you see who Jesus is and you accept Him, you'll never have to beg again. Some said, this is He. Others said, He is like Him. He said, I am He. Therefore they said to Him, how were your eyes opened up? He said, a man called Jesus made clay and smeared it all over my eyes and said, go wash. And I did. And now I'm healed. Do you know because of that Jewish custom, this man who was disabled and couldn't see wasn't allowed in the temple? And, and, and that hasn't changed. In this day, we still have churches that will discriminate because people are black or because people are white or because people are handicapped or they walk in a walker or use a wheelchair or they maybe have some slight abnormalities and they might scream out or they're autistic or whatever the case may be and we'll discriminate. Well, maybe they're gay or maybe they're a lesbian. Maybe they're uh, not able to identify with any specific gender and so we cut them off. Let me tell you something. If we don't welcome those people in the church, how are they going to know the church is and who Jesus is and what his love is about I had some people leave me because I said transgenders are welcome here they aren't going to leave the same but they, they're welcome when they come in oh I can't get any help they won't leave the same when they come and experience the love of Christ in a judgment free zone at Grace Life Church hmm. matter of fact he said he would regenerate us. <laughs> so we've had a dead man that was dead for four days, and now we have a blind man. So Jesus is the blind eye opener. He said he came to open up the eyes of those who were blind, and he came to close the eyes of those who could see. He, this enraged the religious leaders so much. Remember they got so mad that Lazarus had been brought back to life that they wanted to kill him. Now they excommunicate this guy. Before he was healed, he was blind and his disability wouldn't allow him to go to the temple. And now that he's healed and he has the right to go, they don't want him. We'll take all of them. We'll take all of them down at Grace Life the looked over, the left out. If it's just me and Lisa, we're going to take all of them down here at Grace Life. The looked over, the left out. There's a few of you that will be with us. Some of you. <laughs> like, amen. Matter of fact, we're already here. The looked over, the left out. The ones that weren't wandering anywhere else. He just brought us all together. To love on each other. To encourage one another. Number three. To heal a Jewish man or woman with leprosy. That was a proof of the Messiah. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. Leprosy was healed in the Old Testament. Yeah, you can look at Leviticus, the 14th chapter, but he, Nahum, who was healed, wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. Turn with me to Luke's Gospel, chapter 17. Now it happened as he went into Jerusalem that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Then as he entered a certain village, there met him ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned. Here's what happened. Jesus 
healed them, he said, go show yourself to the priest. And on their way to the priest, they were cleansed of their leprosy. And then one of them who was saw that he was healed returned and with a loud voice glorified God, fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. Well, I thought you said the messianic proof was that a Jew was healed. Next verse. So Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? Were there not ten cleansed? In other words, when I sent ten of you away, all ten of you had your leprosy cleansed. What that means is the other nine that didn't come back were Jews. How do we know? Because they continued on their journey to go to the temple to prove that the priest would say that they were well and healed. But this Samaritan couldn't go to the temple, so he returns back to the one that he knows that healed him to give him, great, to give him thankfulness and to be grateful for what God did for him. But those other nine were healed as well, and they were all Jews. And by the time they got to the temple and showed that they were cleansed, I guarantee you that there was another outrage because the high priest or the priest would have said, well, what happened to you? You were a leper and not allowed in the temple a few days ago. And he'd say, just like the blind man said, I don't know if he's a prophet or just a good teacher or a great man. I know once I had leprosy and now I'm whole. Amen. And Jesus proved that he was the Messiah by healing Jews of their leprosy. Folks, he's still a leper cleanser. Leprosy is always a type and shadow of sin, and he's still cleansing sins. That's the greatest miracle that we could ever have is the transformation of the heart being translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light in the blink of an eye. Snap your finger. That's how quick you were transformed from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. Snap your finger again. Those of you this morning that don't believe, that's how fast you can go from darkness to light. That's how fast your whole life can be transformed and renewed by the snap of the finger, the click of an eye. When you believe, you're transformed. We don't have to wait for it to get worse so that He can come back and then we change. I'm not waiting to put on immortality. I'm not waiting to uh, get eternal life. I received eternal life the moment that I believed. Hmm. Number four. He cast out a demon from the deaf and the dumb. Now, there are some um, non-canical writings of Solomon. What do you mean non-canical, preacher? You're using words I don't understand. It's not in the Bible. Take your Bible. Get your Bibles out lift it up. That's called the canonized Bible. 66 books have been canonized. There are other writings that were considered uh, for canonization and they didn't receive it. They weren't, uh, didn't fit the uh, theme of the blood all the way through. Something was off just a little bit, but it doesn't mean uh, that they're not truth. Okay? It didn't say that they were not inspired by the Holy Spirit, but they could not be. I, I, I'm writing a book and I feel like it's inspired, but it's not the Word of God because it's going to be laced with my opinion different things that I've learned through time. There's the Gospel of Thomas. Thomas was a disciple, so he obviously saw some of the things that the Master did that there could see, be some factual information in the Gospel of Thomas. But it's not part of our Bible. But Solomon had some writings that we don't have included in our Bible. And in those writings, there is uh, information that tells us that the Pharisees were casting out devils. That some priests were casting out devils under the old covenant system. Now let me tell you something. I'm going to talk in two weeks because Dr. Howes will be here next week. But in two weeks we'll continue this series on the Messiah. I'm going to talk to you about the mandate of the Messiah found in Mark the 16th chapter. To go into all the world, blah, 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 blah. And part of that is cast out devils. Now there's no parentheses and there's no... Uh, prefix or anything that is added to casting out devils. It doesn't say that you have to walk with the Lord for so long and you got to fast and you got to pray. It says those who believe will cast out devils. And we have non-canical writings of Solomon that say that there were devils being cast out. We even know that Jesus and His disciples were casting out devils. 
Jesus encounters the demoniac in the Gadareans and He says to the man, what's your name? Speaks to the demons inside of what's your name? He said, we're a legion for a minute. But the Jewish culture and these Jewish uh, religious leaders, here was their belief. Their belief was that you had to speak to the person who was demon-possessed. So if I'm going to speak to one who's demon-possessed, they have to hear. And if they hear, then they have to speak and say the name because once the demon was identified, then the Pharisee or whomever could cast that devil out. But if this man is deaf and he's dumb, he would not be able to hear the command, what is your name, demon? And then if even if someone signed it to him, which we don't have any proof of that, he would not have been able to speak back what the demon's name was because he was dumb. It means he couldn't he was a mute, he couldn't speak. So if anyone was to heal a deaf and a dumb person that was demon possessed and deliver them from the demons, they would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was the Messiah. Look with me at the scripture found in Luke the eleventh chapter. And as he was casting out a demon, and it was mute, so it was that when the demon had gone out, the mute spoke, and those multitudes marveled. So Jesus didn't have to say, what's your name? And He didn't have to get the man to speak out anything. He just delivered the man from the demons. I believe that in the very presence of God, which you house the presence of God on the inside of you, the demons have to flee. I'm, I'm tired of us having to listen to people putting things on us to tell us, well, you've got to fast and you've got to pray and you've got to do this for 25 days and you've got to take my course to pay $100 for it. And once you pay my $100 fee to take my course, then you're ca uh, capable and equipped to, to cast out devils. No. If you believe you have the power living and dwelling on the inside of you, you have been equipped with delivering power to rebuke demons and they have to go. Well, preacher, Jesus said that there was some type that only come forth through prayer and fasting. That's not what He said. Look at the context of the Scripture. He's talking about unbelief. Because if He said that there was demons, some type of demons that only came forth through prayer and fasting, then you're going to have to add certain things and learn demons and different rankings of demons. And listen, you're a believer. You've got blood, royal blood flowing through your veins. You have the power. The problem has been you've been duped and stupefied to believe that you've got to do all types of works to cast out devils. Greater. Somebody say greater. Greater is He that lives in me than he that's within the world. And Jesus told His disciples that this type of unbelief only comes forth through prayer and fasting. Because fasting is not to twist God's arm to get Him to do something. He already wants to do more for you than you can realize. He already has your best interest at heart. We don't have to twist God's arm. He wants to do these things for us. Fasting is for us. Fasting gets our heart and mind in a mode of believing things that we wouldn't normally believe. It helps us to align spiritually, to get, hear the mind of Christ, to, to realize we are who we are, He says we are, and to have what we says He uh, that we can have. So I'm not telling you not fast. I'm not downplaying fasting. I'm not talking, uh, uh, you know, the people who are fasting are out there somewhere. No, if Holy Spirit tells you to fast, then you you better obey Holy Spirit. I don't need a man to tell me to fast. <laughs> Moving on. Holy Spirit can talk to you and tell you when to fast and what to fast. But I don't need to go on a starvation mode to get God to do something. He said, if you ask anything in my name, I'll do it. Believe in your heart. All things are possible. So I believe and I ask and it's done in Jesus' name. So why aren't things happening in the church? I'm going to give you my opinion. Okay, look up. This is Jamie Wright's opinion. This is not thus saith the Lord, Scripture laced or anything like this. This is my opinion. My opinion is that we don't see things happening in the church 
because we have people that have heard messages from a pulpit that put so many things on them that they have to accomplish that people don't believe they really have the power that God's placed on the inside of them. They're still trying to obtain something that they already have by doing all of these things. If you will realize that you already have those things in you and you will awaken to those things, then you continue to feed those things by your readings and your your prayers. And when we pray, we got prayer meeting Monday night, 7 o'clock. Pastor Hank will be back there leading prayer meeting tomorrow night. If you can come 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, we'll be there 45 minutes to our praying. What we're doing is we're creating a highway to expedite the things that God already wants to do. Because He gave us the power to loosen the bind. And what He said is when I give you the keys of the kingdom, those keys are to loose those things which are already loosed in heaven and to bind those things which are already bound in heaven. That's the, that's the Scripture. So we're not doing, we're not asking God to do something. We're asking Him to loose what He's already loose. In other words, send it on down, Lord. Send it on, manifest it. Manifest it in our presence. That's what we're asking for. As you're standing, I want you to look at the screen. John, the 14th chapter. I want you to look at the screen because it's probably not in the translation you're looking at this morning unless you have a smart device. Jesus said, wrong scripture, babe, John 14, 12. It's the very last slide. Thank you. I tell you the truth. Whoever believes in me, you know what that Greek word whoever is? Whoever. Put your name right there. I tell you the truth. If Jamie believes in me, if Gary believes in me, if Bev believes in me, he will be able, she will be able to do what I've done. What's he talking about? The Messianic miracles. The, the miracles that the Messiah did, you're able to do them. That's hard for us to swallow. I feel it in my spirit. We, we resist that. Oh, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I kicked the dog on the way out. I said a cuss word this week. Whoever believes in me will be able to do what I've done. But they will do even greater. Somebody say greater. Than these things. Why? How? Because I will return to my Father. And He's there, folks. He finished His work. He sat down at the right hand of the Father. And now He's advocating on our behalf to make sure that we get all the benefits and all the power that He promised. And He poured it out on the day of Pentecost. And He hasn't stopped pouring it out. He popped the cork. He started pouring, and He's never stopped pouring. He's still pouring out the Holy Spirit in our hearts. I'm thankful that He performed these miracles to prove that He was the Messiah. Unfortunately, those, He said He came to His own and His own received Him not. They rejected Him. They saw the miracles performed before their very eyes, and they still didn't believe. Thomas touched him, put his finger in his side, touched his holes in his hands. And Jesus said, Blessed are those who haven't seen and still believe. I've seen Jesus in my spirit mind. I've seen Jesus in other believers. I've never seen the manifest presence of Jesus in His bodily form, but I believe He's real. I believe everything that He is written about Him in the Word of God is true. I believe that it unfolds and unveils a picture to us of who really, He really is and it becomes a mirror that when we look into it, we see our reflection that as He is, so are we in this world. I've had it prophesied and I believe that the dead will be raised in our ministry. When I say I or I include you, I'm not talking about me as an individual. But we're here to remove grave clothes this morning. 
I believe a lot most of you this, in the, under the sound of my voice have accepted and you believe. So we are here to unwrap that head cloth this morning so that you can see a, a clearer picture and that you can hear with better understanding of who you are. We're here to unwrap the grave clothes of your you're not a stiff-necked, hard-hearted Christian. You can wrap those arms this morning and you can lift them. You can praise Him. You can lay hands on the sick and they will recover. We're here to unwrap the grave clothes from your legs so that you can begin to walk where Holy Spirit leads you to walk. He'll guide your footsteps. He'll take you to people that need to be touched, that need to be encouraged, that need to be saved, that need to be fed. A lot of people are looking for a handout. And that's okay, but you can give them more than a handout. You can give them a hand up and help them. Would you bow your heads? I'm going to ask you to contemplate what you've heard this morning. I'm going to ask you to respond to that as Michaela sings. right there and look at it. Just look at your hand right now. Say, these hands were created to bring healing. I believe it. Amen. Take these hands this week and lay them on people. Gently, compassionately, with love, lay hands on the sick this week. I believe they'll, you'll begin to see people healed not because you come to Grace Life, not because you read five chapters, not because you fasted and prayed this week, but because the God of miracles is living on the inside of you. I want to remind you of the prophetic declaration God has given to us for this year. Embrace what God sends your way. Embrace people. Embrace opportunity. Explore, explore new areas of God. He's manifold. Expect miracles, signs, and wonders in the world, not just in special services. Encourage each other daily. Engage with people showing them the love of Christ. Stop trying to earn anything from Him, but do put some effort into loving and serving Him as well as loving and serving others. Be excited about life and what Holy Spirit is doing. Things that you used to strive and labor in will begin to be effortless and flow naturally. And pray this prayer. Lord, may the eyes of my heart be enlightened by Holy Spirit so that I may know the hope that I have in and through Him. 